Hello, a very good morning to all those who have joined on this YouTube channel. Many thanks for joining in. I hope that all of you do find these helpful in your preparation for FRCS Urology Vivas. I would like to add just a note that I have not taken any of these questions from any book and have made them up myself. So today, as a continuation of pediatric urology table, we will talk about hyperspadias. Yes, you heard that right. Hyperspadias it is. As many trainees do not do it well before the exam. And they feel that it is not an important topic as far as the exam is concerned. Let me tell you here that hyperspadias is a very important scenario and often asked in detail. So please, please do it really well. You must not go for this exam without doing it. You are expected to have a good knowledge of hyperspadias. It can either come as a full 10 minute scenario or it can be a part of scenarios in which you can be asked on multiple conditions of pediatric urology. The pace of the examiner will help you in knowing what it is. So coming back to the pediatric urology table, the viva topic of hyperspadias. Having said that, let's get started. So it again, it is your exam day. The timetable shows that now it is going to be pediatric urology viva. You will be asked two vivas each of 10 minutes duration in pediatric urology. On approaching the table, make eye contact with both the examiners with a pleasant smile on your face and shake hands firmly. This I keep on telling you all because it does give you marks. Sit down and take paper and pencil which is kept on the table. The examiner will then start asking the question. Jot down the important points like the age and the gender of the child because you don't, uh, you should not try to ask again and again about the age and the gender while answering the question because that leaves a bad impression that you were not listening to the examiner. The examiner will then ask you, question, mom brings her 12 month old baby boy to your pediatric clinic with distal hypospadias. Can you describe what is hypospadias? Alternatively, you may be shown an image of phallus with hyperspadiac meatus and asked to describe what hyperspadias is. The way I will answer is, this image shows hyperspadias, which is a congenital abnormality of phallus where the urethral meatus is not at the tip of the phallus, rather it is located on the ventral aspect or the undersurface of phallus anywhere from the glands as far back as the perineum. Examiner will then ask you, can you please highlight the salient features of hypospadias? Yes, hypospadias may be associated with ventral cordy or downward curvature and a dorsal hooded foreskin which is deficient ventrally. At this point, examiner will say that the mother is very anxious and wants to know, is it quite common? It is seen in 1 in 300 boys. They will then ask you to classify the hypospadias. Hypospadias can be classified according to the position of the urethral meatus as distal, middle and proximal hypospadias. In distal hypospadias, meatus may be glandular, coronal or subcoronal. In the middle, hypospadias, meatus lies on the phallic shaft, distal, mid or proximal. While the proximal hypospadias has the meatus at penoscrotal, scrotal or the perineal site. Here, please do note that you can be asked to draw it. So please do practice that as well. Examiner will then ask you, what is the most common type of hypospadias? The most common form of hypospadias is distal hypospadias, which occurs in 50 to 80% of the cases followed by middle hypospadias, which occurs in 30%, and then proximal hypospadias, which is seen in about 20% of the cases. Next question. The parents want to know as to why it happened, or alternatively, they can simply ask you, what is the etiology of hypospadias? 
Well, hyperspadias occurs in 1 in 300 boys. It is a developmental disorder and is caused by genetic predisposition, endocrine and environmental causes. Here they may ask you about the family history. So, 4 to 10 percent have a family history of hyperspadias. Can you tell me the risk factors which are associated with hyperspadias? These are family history, preterm or low birth weight of child and maternal history of smoking. How are you going to examine this child with distal hyperspadias? I will do an examination in the presence of a chaperone and mother and will look at the overall health of the child, abdomen, the foreskin to rule out a dorsal hooded foreskin, phallus to check for the hypospadic meatus location in urethra and will examine the testis to rule out disorder of sexual development. The next question the examiner can ask you here is, can you tell me the indications of surgery for this child? Well, indications of surgery include functional reasons, cosmetic reasons and psychological reasons. Amongst the functional reasons include unable to pee straight or the presence of cordy, while the cosmetic reason is a dorsal hooded prepuce presence. Examiner will then go on to ask, at what age will you operate on this child and why? Well, I will operate at around 12 months of age because the child is easy to handle, there is less anesthesia risk and also there is good development of genitalia by then. Would you advise parents anything in the meanwhile? Well, I will advise the parents to avoid circumcision in the meanwhile. The next question, what are the treatment options for this child with distal hyperspadias? For this child, the treatment options are either a tubularized incised plate or a thaj duple. And if it is more distal, I can do a meatal advancement and glanuloplasty incorporated. Here the examiners will ask you about the principles of surgery. These include correction of cordy, which is also referred to as orthoplasty, the reconstruction of urethra, which is urethroplasty, fashioning of a slit like urethral meatus, that is meatoplasty, and reconstruction of the ventral aspect of glands, that is glanuloplasty. A little bit about the correction of cordy here, that is orthoplasty. Normally, when you deglove the penis, that is uh, enough to correct the cordy if it is present. And if the cordy persists despite that, then you can either use dorsal plication or a ventral incision graft at this point in time. So, you need to know the difference. The examiner can then ask you about the difference between the tubularized incised plate and the thaish duple. So, a little bit about the difference I would mention here is that if the urethral plate is narrow, then we give a midline incision in it and tubularize it over a catheter and hence the name tubularized incised plate. While if the urethral plate is wide, then we can simply tubularize it without any incision and this is called thaish duple. Remember, there are a number of procedures uh, which are available for the hypospadias repair. Stick with these two. I think they are more than enough. What are the complications of... Then the examiner can ask you, what if, if everything is going well, what are the complications of hypospadiac repair? These can be early or late. And the late complications include meatal stenosis, urethrocutaneous fistula, or repair dehiscence. Then, the, if you have any time left, then they can go on to ask if the child had a hypospadic meatus on the mid shaft, then how would you proceed? Again, you can quote these two options which I have told you, which is the tubularized incised plate and thaish duple, 
that is more than enough for that as well and or they can ask you about the treatment options or the repair options of a proximal hyperspadias in this you can use a tubularized incised plate but other treatment options include a two stage technique uh, in which you can use a buyer's flap i hope uh, this is how the scenario is going to progress from uh, the start to the finish and you can see that they have asked you about the examination the investigation uh, the examination the treatment the complications and uh, you have progressed through it and so i uh, in about 10 minutes time so i do hope you find it useful and helpful thank you very much for joining in thank you again